Okay. So, as we've established, we're here to talk about meeting the, the needs of students with disabilities. And I am Dr. Lindsay Vreeland. My pronouns are she, her. Y'all can call me Lindsay. And I am an inclusive teaching coordinator for the Center of Innovative Teaching and Learning here at NIU. Um, and today, I'm hoping that we'll be able to understand that accommodations change the delivery method of content, not the standards. We talk a lot about uh, not wanting to uh, make things too simple for people. Um, we're going to talk about that today and, and how that's not really um, what our goal is when we're uh, meeting the needs of, of students uh, with disabilities and uh, that have other needs. Um, we're going to identify ways that accommodations can be built into coursework, into policies. Um, we're going to identify ways that materials can become accessible and identify accessibility tools and services that are available. Um, some of you might have been in my workshop last spring or fall, I can't remember, last year, um, where I was talking about neurodiversity. And some of these things are going to align with what I talked about in that presentation. So um, it's uh, if it feels repetitive because of that, it's just because uh, when our students have needs, good things are good things. Um, so I want to, before we like get really into uh, the weeds, I want to acknowledge that there are differing opinions on language surrounding disabilities. So sometimes people will say students with disabilities versus disabled students. Um, so students with disabilities is uh, a way to focus on the person, not the disability. Um, but some people with disabilities, they feel like their identity cannot be separated from their disabilities. Um, so they might prefer uh, being labeled as a, dis a disabled student or a disabled person or um, what have you. So uh, language shifts for reasons, and we just have to be aware that um, not everybody likes the same things when they're uh, being referred to. Um, we talk a lot about special needs um, in when we talk about accommodations, and I just want to acknowledge that um, people with disabilities have needs, everybody has needs, um, and so that's how I'll be referring to them, and some people uh, get particularly um, frustrated by uh, their needs being called special needs, so that's just another thing to be aware of. Um, all of our students have needs, all of us have needs, whether or not we are disabled. And um, some recommendations after saying that is that uh, there are, there's going to be preferred language, um, depending on the person or the community. Use what preferred language they, they have. If somebody um, wants to talk about themselves as being disabled, if they want to talk about themselves as being a wheelchair user, um, we just use the language that they're using about themselves. Um, when talking about disabilities, I'm painting a broad, um, a broad picture today, um, but there are differing disabilities that require, you know, different things. So if you can be as specific as possible when talking to their stu your students or talking about disabilities, that's great. Um, and just that disabled is not a bad word. Um, I've heard a lot of people talking about differently abled um, and labeling um, people as such. If that's the, the way that you want to label yourself um, as a disabled person, that's great. Um, but we need to not be afraid of saying disabled. Um, I also want to talk about uh, accessibility as being a mandatory thing. So at NIU, um, we, we know that this is uh, a necessity 
uh, the Ethics and Compliance Office says that all content needs to be accessible. And if you are having problems doing that for some reason, um, please do reach out to me after this uh, presentation because that's something that uh, my center can help you specifically do. Make sure that things are accessible and that um, students can access things. Um, and something that is, is super helpful is just standardizing the accessibility in your course. So making sure that all the documents that you have up for um, assignment sheets are accessible, not just giving them out as needed per student. Um, there might be a reason why you would prefer to put up a PDF over a Word doc. Um, but the PDF isn't necessarily going to be accessible. So just put both of those documents up on your Blackboard so people can decide which one they want to access. Things like that um, are really helpful. And then uh, students don't have to out themselves um, if they don't want to talk about their disability. Um, they don't have to request things, feel like they're bothering you, um, or and there's not this sense of that they're getting uh, special treatment. Um, I think most of you have been teaching for a little while, so you're probably well aware that students don't have to disclose their disabilities. So even if they have letters of accommodation, that doesn't necessarily say um, what their disabilities are and um, wouldn't necessarily be appropriate for you to ask about that. Um, students that have disabilities that don't have uh, documentations also might make requests without disclosing why they need specific things. Um, but it's important to recognize that 27% of adults in the U.S. have some type of disability. A lot of us have invisible disabilities. Um, and the status of ha being disabled is something that um, we can shift into and out of throughout our lives. So sometimes disabilities are long-term, sometimes you are you have them from birth, uh, but it might be something that is sudden, is due to uh, issues with mobility because of an accident, and is something that um, people will move out of uh, once they heal. Um, and as we're starting off this semester, uh, it's important to recognize that also not all of our students are able to get into the DRC and get letters of accommodations, <clears throat> excuse me, before the semester starts. So, um, and if they're, uh, if they get hurt, if they have an injury, if they've learned something different about themselves, they might not be able to be as proactive about getting accommodations as we would like. So um, just be aware that that's not something that uh, is necessarily going to be super obvious or so super easy for them to navigate. So if we are, um, as in instructional fac faculty, um, if we're open to students coming to us and asking us for things without having to uh, reveal a lot of personal information, that can be really, really helpful for our students. As I mentioned earlier, the standards of your course and your learning objectives for your course doesn't have to change uh, when you make your course more accessible. So the delivery method of the content or time spent working on assignments might change. Um, so, you know, students might get extra time on assignments. They might have early access to materials. Maybe there's um, alternate formats for uh, for work that is supposed to be visual or audio dependent. Um, maybe you're giving them free use of technology. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit today about uh, accessibility for your classroom, for technology, assignments, attendance, and communication. Um, and this is going to be, this is a lot thing, of things to cover, right? So this is going to be pretty brief, um, but please do reach out and ask additional questions if you have them after the presentation. Um, so when we're thinking about classrooms, um, many of us don't really have a lot of um, choice over where we're teaching. 
Um, for those of us that are teaching uh, CSWGS classes, we are going to be teaching in class or in buildings that have um, gender inclusive bathrooms. Um, that is something that is uh, fundamental to that program. Um, but not all of us are going to have the ability to um, pick and choose in those ways uh, because we might be teaching classes with 200 students and there are only so many classrooms on campus that will allow that. Um, but we can still think a little bit about um, making sure that students that need um, accessible desks or tables that need outlets, um, what can we do to help them get those things? Um, and it might just be making a call for us to make sure that uh, somebody's looking into it, somebody's going to deliver um, the table that's accessible for our, uh, somebody who uses mobility aids, um, that there is an extension cord in the room so that somebody can uh, not be set up against the wall and use their computer, little things like that. Um, we also wanna think about our attendance and behavior expectations. Um, for some of us that are teaching first year and like 100 level courses, um, there is often this sense of, we need to make sure students are coming in and take these things seriously. And we need to really um, be hard and clear with our policies for attendance and uh, behavior. Um, and that can be a hard balance when students are uh, experiencing for the first time that they have control over their uh, their schedules, their bodies, where they want to go, what they want to do, and not have uh, truancy officers after them, right? So um, I uh, would recommend thinking about trust and communication when building our policies and not punishment. I would also recommend thinking about, uh, when we think about behavior, if students have uh, particular needs that they need to be able to drink or eat um, because maybe medication or um, the way that they process uh, particular nutrients or whatever, um, that might be something that we want to uh, think about and decide whether or not that is actually disruptive to what's going on in class, or um, maybe there is a time and a place that that can be done um, that we would welcome. Um, and there's also students that might need to move their bodies or even physically leave the classroom, whether it's to use the restroom or um, to walk because of uh, particular things going on with their bodies. And um, it can seem very rude or can seem disruptive sometimes when students have those needs. Um, but that's something that if you are uh, opening up to the class and you're saying, hey, you might have these needs, just come chat with me and we can figure out how to make that happen so that you are still receiving information and um, able to do what you need to do, then students seem to be uh, more receptive. It might be talking to them about, uh, excuse me, sitting in particular spots in the room so they have access to doors or they can um, stand in the back and move around without uh, blocking the view of uh, the screen or the board or whatever that might be. Um, and then technology. Technology is a big thing that uh, people have pretty strong policies about. I know a lot of people believe that uh, notes should be handwritten. Um, people remember things better. There's, uh, you know, a lot of studies and I totally understand that. I am a, an English major and I handwrite notes still. Um, but we also have to understand that there are a variety of reasons why that doesn't necessarily work for students. Um, so to require them to have a letter, um, in order to be able to use their computer um, is this way of 
of sort of outing them. It's also a way of uh, making students who don't have letters of accommodations feel like their needs aren't um, as serious. There's students that I've met with arthritis or um, who have connective tissue disorders like I do, that it can be very hard to uh, hold a pencil for a long period of time. Um, they might not be able to write as quickly as other students. Maybe typing feels better or is just a little bit more easy. They might have a talk to text program on their computer where it would be taking notes for them that they can later review and um, edit as needed. So um, that might be something to talk to your students about. What kind of technology is acceptable? What isn't acceptable? If they need to record during class, how do we use those recordings? Where do they uh, live? Um, what do we owe each other as far as uh, understanding privacy and um, and what's appropriate uh, to to share and reproduce online based off of what's happened in class. So those are conversations that can be had in a class. It can be something that even um, as a large group, you come up with the community agreements about, OK, this is how we're going to use technology. Um, we're going to make sure that we're only using XYZ programs. Um, it's OK to use our phones if we're going to be doing this, this, and this. And as a group, your students might come together and, and figure out something that works better for them. Um, it might be specific to their class versus your other classes where they might have specific needs or um, things that they're concerned or worried about that they might address um, creating those agreements. Something else that um, is really big that seems to come up over and over again with uh, students with disabilities is uh, issues with communication. So many of us know that there is a possibility that we might have to uh, have students use interpreters um, or the communication access real-time translation cart services. Um, and those are provided directly through the DRC. Um, but in order for those services to work the best way that they can, um, students and their uh, interpreters or uh, translators need um, access to class time, whether it's a lecture or even like um, a larger group discussion. Uh, if there are going to be things that are put up on the board or uh, videos that are going to be played, they need access to that information too. Um, even if you have uh, an, like small group work or presentations, if you're going to any events or asking um, people to come in or um, or even uh, opening up the floor to other students to ask questions. All of this stuff um, has to sort of be recorded by them in order for our students to get all of the information needed. So I think that um, in my experience, people are aware that like less lectures need to, um, need to be supported, but there's so much other information that happens in our classes um, that isn't formal lecture, that is really important, whether it's from other uh, students in the class asking questions and we generate information that maybe they um, hadn't thought about before or were making connections that weren't clear before, or even just other students in the class uh, explaining things or um, making connections on their own. So we need to make sure that uh, if our students need CART services, if they need interpreters, that we're trying to get them as much information as possible so they're not missing out. Um, the DRC has a, a page about interpreter and CART service requests. Um, they even have a video uh, about 
how that works. So uh, I will send that information out after this workshop too, if you have questions about that. You can re review that and feel free to um, float any of those questions along my way as well. Um, and there's also this element of adding closed captions or including transcripts for videos and audio files. So uh, some of our um, video conferencing software will do automatic transcripts, like Teams does an automatic transcript um, that you can uh, show or not show on your screen, but once I stop this recording, I'm going to have a transcript to go along with it. Um, so that might be useful for uh, those of us that are teaching online courses or are creating um, even sort of like how-to videos that are going to be supporting our students that are, are meeting in person. Um, but we want to think about um, other ways that we are uh, supporting our students. If we're using videos off of YouTube about mitochondria, are do they automatically have um, closed captions? Is that something that we um, need to be seeking out if it's not there? Um, if you want to upload your videos onto uh, Kaltura, or even if you use a platform like YouTube for videos that you create for your class, um, there are options for embedding closed captions. There are other uh, resources available to create those closed captions for you. So you don't actively have to go through and, um, and create those on your own, which can be very time consuming or editing them on your own, which is also time consuming. But um, we need to be sort of aware of that as we are creating content um, that we can hopefully use over and over that it's as accessible as possible because um, if, you know, in a class of 100, two students can't use the materials, then the materials aren't meeting the needs of of your class and we need to uh, regroup and rethink about um, what programs we're using. There's so many free tools that we have now that um, will help you with this. It's just a matter of using those tools instead of maybe the ones that you are uh, used to using all the time. With assignments and materials, um, a lot of us don't want to uh, give too much stuff to our students off the bat, um, giving them access to their uh, paper that's going to be due in November might feel overwhelming or might feel um, unimportant or confusing given the information they have now in September. Um, but giving students access or early access to materials can be very helpful. If you are somebody who does lecture and you have lecture notes, having them online um, can be very helpful. Maybe that's something that you want to do minutes before class so that students can follow along on the lecture notes as you're lecturing and um, include their own notes on there. If you're using PowerPoints um, in class, including those as well, is, is super helpful. Students can take notes on the PowerPoints as things are coming up in class and they're not required to then uh, write as much when it comes to uh, when it comes to note taking in class. Um, making sure that we're using accessible mediums for files um, and content. Um, and that we uh, have files that are um, that uh, can be used by e-readers. Um, I think most of us understand that uh, if a student needs Braille, that that's something that we need to uh, take into consideration and make sure that our files will work with their computers. Um, but also, if there's something that needs to be printed, then we need to talk to the DRC about that too. 
We might want to build in uh, flexibility into across deadlines. As I said earlier, students have a lot of needs, whether it's, um, you know, I have, uh, I'm a caretaker or I'm working full-time job or um, I had a Crohn's flare up. So having that flexibility for students can be really, really useful. It might look like asking students to turn in something um, two days before you actually feel like it should be turned in and then um, opening that up the, the rest of the way to make sure that they're working on it a little bit, but also sort of gauge where, um, where students are. It also might be looking at like, okay, we're going to be writing this paper uh, and it's due at the end of September. What's the latest it could be done in order for us to make sure that you are uh, going to be able to focus on the next thing and move along to the next steps? So having a, an idea about what's the last sort of reasonable amount of time that uh, or date that somebody could turn something in and just having that sort of um, planned out already um, can be really helpful, whether, again, it's a student that has uh, a disability and requires extra time for assignments, or if students have other needs come up um, and we have to sort of react to those in real time. Um, grading feedback options, if we can get a variety of, of options for our students, that's great. Um, Written comments uh, tend to be very popular, and I understand why. Um, for for those of us that have to grade a hundred papers and um, are doing that at all um, times of the day, it seems like sometimes that's maybe the easiest option. But um, you could also record. Uh, an MP3 file, you could create a little video that's um, just sort of a, a screen grab that is uh, you talking, but looking over the uh, the paper. Um, doesn't have to show your face. Um, and those are those are super helpful too. And from what I've heard, the people um, people that are moving towards audio or video uh, feedback specifically. Um, it creates an option or it's um, once you switch over, it takes less time because you're not going to be getting into the weeds with everything. Um, you are going to be focusing on main ideas and you're going to be focusing on uh, meeting expectations for assignments rather than, oh, here's this comma. It's not where it's supposed to be. So um people that move over to that tend to like that and they can usually uh, produce those pretty quickly um, versus written comments, which uh, tend to take a lot of time. Um, Michelle, how would you provide the audio video, video feedback? Um, Yeah, so there's a there's a, a couple ways that you could do it. You could um, upload them to uh, to Kaltura, and you could provide a specific link to the student that it's uh, relevant to. You could do the same thing. I know people have uh, YouTube channels that they use, and they'll have them private, and just like you can refer to the link. Um, but I also believe that you can upload the video file um, or audio file in response to uh, um, what I want to say. In the feedback section for Blackboard and either of those would work. You would just want to talk to your students about how to access that stuff. Um, and from what I have read as far as like research, but also heard from other people, um, students are more likely to to listen to this feedback and to hear you uh, 
talk about these things rather than read written feedback. This is also a great option for those of us that can't do one on one conferences with students regularly. Um, because you can still give them personalized feedback and make it feel like a conversation, even if you don't have the actual time to um, commit to 15 minutes with each individual student um, within a week. I'm going to write down a note, Michelle, and I'm going to make sure that um, in the materials that I send out after this presentation that I include ways that that might happen. Of course. Okay. We, um, Oh, I, I also should say that um, for those of us that are that are thinking about maybe transitioning to audio or video uh, feedback options, that might be something that you would also want to float out to your class and see if they have preferences over that. Um, maybe there are specific students that would prefer written feedback. And so maybe that's something that, you know, you're only transitioning um, five students at a time and seeing how they feel about it. Or if you have three classes, maybe you switch over to one class and try it. Um, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. This stuff also uh, impacts your time and your brain. So if it doesn't meet your needs and it doesn't seem to be meeting the needs of the students, then we don't have to do everything, right? Um, Another thing that I think most of us are familiar with now too is providing alt text descriptions for any, any images um, for PowerPoints like this. Uh, you know, alt text descriptions tend to be pretty uh, straightforward. Um, fingers on a computer um, that uh, is using Braille uh, for this PowerPoint image in particular. Um, but for those of us that use a lot of graphs or charts, um, alt text can be very helpful um, for, for that. It can also be helpful for, um, I've heard a lot of people talking about students that are colorblind and sometimes charts just don't work for them if they are uh too reliant on different shades of of colors um so there might also be this option to do alt text descriptions for for things like that that might help students that um have particular uh needs because of uh disabilities with their uh with their vision um and also it's controversial, but allowing students to use AI tools um, is also uh, very helpful. There might be specific types of AI that you will let your students use. Um, again, it might be the talk to text feature when they're taking notes. It might be um, if they're supposed to be drafting a paper, maybe they're using talk to text specifically. And maybe their draft looks a little bit um, clunky because of that when they're submitting something to you. And we're just aware of that and we, um, you know, can move forward from there. But if there are particular types of, of AI tools that are really useful for your students, um, being open to having that conversation and being open to them uh, telling you about those things is really useful. Sometimes they know things, um, well, no, I want to back up. They often know things that we don't know. They know about tools that, especially if they're free tools, that we don't know. <clears throat> and that might be something you want to share with the rest of the class, but it also might be something that you want to be aware of moving forward, like, oh, okay, the student who needed um, this particular thing liked this tool. Um, this e-reader option is is really great for um, students that are looking at these type type of texts um, because some of the stuff isn't um, isn't free and some of it isn't cheap and so 
it also is helpful if you can give uh, students some recommendations about what works um, for in future classes based off of what students are telling you works now. Um, but when it does come to AI, um, AI is really, really controversial right now about how we use it, when we use it, should we use it, um, but having really um, frank conversations with students is um, going to be the way forward for all of us <laughs> from here on out, but especially if there's specific students that want to be using um, particular types of AI, um, just having those conversations and saying, yeah, that's okay if you use it in this way. Um, and being open to those conversations instead of um, shutting them down or being very, very afraid of, um, of cheating, of plagiarism, um, of those, those things that can be uh, really scary for students to be accused of. Microsoft, um, which we all know we have access to, right? Um, sometimes students don't know that they have access to uh, Microsoft um, software for whatever reason. They don't realize that it comes for free um, with them being a student here, but they have um, options already built into PowerPoint and Word about checking accessibility, about um, uh, uh, using immersive reader and read aloud options. So uh, you and students can see if things are accessible for others, but there's also options where um, text can actively be read aloud to students. Um, and you can see how text is read aloud um, also so that you have an idea of whether or not your uh, documents and your files are, are what you want them to be. Um, but students don't always know about the um, read aloud options. And that's something that's been huge for a lot of my students that get really overwhelmed or really uh, confused by big walls of text when they have like a two page assignment sheet, right? Um, so for students with like dyslexia, that's a really big thing that they can um, use the assignment sheet. They can have a read along um, option and they can actively be interacting with the assignment sheet, highlighting it, making comments, whatever, and um, create a relationship with that specific uh, document that might be difficult to have otherwise. Um, so sharing things like that with your students is really helpful, but also for you all to be aware of that they exist and it's free and it's just there and easy um, is also very helpful. We also have built-in accessibility on Blackboard. So we have Blackboard Ally. Um, we have options to download uh, files in alternative formats. We have the accommodations and exceptions options too for uh, assignments where we can create um, the accommodations for particular students to give them extra time on assignments. Um, but we also have accessibility checker in Adobe Acrobat and we have uh, through Cido, we have some accessible templates. I will send out um, all of these, uh, what do I want to say, the links to these different guides too after this presentation so you can um, click around and you can see what those things look like um, before you uh, play with them in your own course. But um, again, students might not be aware that they can download things in different formats. That might be something that you just share with them. Um, and Maybe it only impacts one student in the class, but I think that it's good for uh, everybody to be aware that there are some options uh, within Blackboard that maybe they're not aware of and that uh, could be super helpful for them. Okay, 
So I've been talking at you a lot, um, but I want to make sure that we get a chance to uh, hear from you all. So if you have particular questions, um, and maybe I can't answer them now, but maybe it's sending you a link after, and that's fine. Um, I'd love you to ask questions, um, but I'm also curious if there are some ways that you've made your course materials or your classroom more accessible, if you would like to share those. Um, and I'm also curious what challenges you've encountered with accessibility or needing necessary accommodations, because some of these accommodations um, aren't always easy to meet when we have particular types of classes. So we might not have set up our assignments or this particular room or might not even have like time to uh, meet accommodation needs, um, especially for those of us that teach those eight week classes that goes really, really quickly. And so giving extra time on assignments might look a lot different in those classes versus the traditional 16 week classes. Anyway, questions that we have, things that we're doing that are cool that we would like to share. Um, and you can type in the chat or you can uh, turn on your mic. Either one is great. Brenna attended Blackboard Ally training yesterday. I love that. Yes, we have other workshops that focus on specific things, especially within Blackboard, um, that are, what do I want to say, more crunchy, um, more uh, tangible things, um, maybe than uh, what I'm talking about here today. Um, talking about like wider concepts and uh, things to sort of think about. Um, but we do have Blackboard Ally training, which is amazing and does go over uh, thinking about how to make those materials uh, accessible and inclusive and gives you a score, which is also like um, a really cool way to uh, see how accessible your things are and maybe not always feel discouraged because you're like, Okay, it's not great, but it's 80%. So small changes here. Um, yeah, awesome. Thanks for sharing, Brenna. She has definitely used the accessibility checker. Um, made sure to be flexible with students. Oh, I love that. Um, Michelle said uh, that some students have recorded reflections. Um, on readings rather than writing them out. I think that's great. There's a lot of um, things like reflections, things like um, whether it's on like readings or um, what they've accomplished in, in group work or whatever, um, projects, but also sometimes when they are um, brainstorming things might be easier for students to record rather than write and um for brains that are neurodiverse that might work but also for disabilities it might just be easier and so i love that your students have those options i tell my students can't tell students that um they don't need drc notes i love that and i think that um many of us tell students like the first week of class like hey come talk to me if you need things um and we should and please do 
Uh, but also checking in with students again and saying, hey, like now that this big assignment is coming up, like what are you noticing that you need? Like come and talk to me. Um, you could even do an option where they could do an anonymous poll or not poll, um, survey. It could also be a poll, I guess, um, where students don't have to directly tell you um, what things they specifically need, but maybe you get a feel about like what things in general people need in the class. I love that. And some of those things that feel easier to do with smaller classes too. Um, for those of us that do have huge, huge classes, it's hard. It's hard to manage the needs of everybody and it's hard to manage um, differing deadlines and, and all these moving parts when we're trying to get through particular material. Um, so this isn't to say that you need to do X, Y, Z things and it's gonna be easy and it's not gonna take some thought um, or a process or, you know, 30 minutes per document to look over the ally checker and switch things up. It's going to take time, um, but hopefully we put in the time now and it becomes easier in the future. We can reuse those documents or whatever. Um, Michelle's also been trying to build in more choice for students to demonstrate mastery of skill or understanding. Yeah, infographics, podcasts, videos or presentation. I love that too, Michelle. I think that um, it's it can be easier to grade um, grading assignments, essays, traditional essays, um, or use sort of traditional exams um, for for grading purposes, but it doesn't work well for everybody's brains. And is it an actual demonstration of like learning things and being able to apply things, or is it just them regurgitating information and um, short term memory stuff? Um, so I love the options. That's great. And surprisingly, a lot of students still choose to write things. Um, maybe it's not surprising. I would have chose to to write things too because English major. Um, but it can be a big deal for students that are having a hard time seeing their way through a 10 page paper to be able to do a podcast instead. Um, I love that. Then again, not everybody's gonna take you up on that, but just giving them other options um, can feel huge, can feel important, can feel like, they're being uh, recognized as, as individuals and they can approach you when they have particular needs. Um, and I'm sure all of you, you're here, uh, which is, is great, but I'm sure that because you're thinking about this, um, that students are feeling comfortable to come talk to you and you know recognize the uh, warmth and the care. Um, but it can be very hard, especially when students are just starting classes, when they're um, not sure if it's inappropriate to ask for things. Some students just don't know how to advocate for themselves or um, what they can ask for. So putting it out there and making sure that they know um, that you recognize they might need things that you're not offering can go a really far way. Thank you, Megan. On that, I'm going to uh, be wrapping up. I know that there are some other people typing in the chat and I will uh, recognize those things as they come in, but I just wanted to uh, close out thinking about a few things. Um, when we're thinking about designing courses, um, we want to make sure that we're thinking about student success. And if we're not taking into account students with 
uh, disabilities, are they going to be able to be successful? If we're not being proactive thinking about their needs, if we're not being proactive thinking about students in general, if we're just thinking about the information, um, can students be successful in those, in those situations? Um, and just because they have been doesn't mean that it's the best it could be, right? Um, so uh, just, again, some closing thoughts. Um, something that, uh, as I haven't labeled myself as a disabled person, I don't think in this uh, presentation, but I am a disabled person um, and have in, invisible disabilities. And something that um, disabled students often talk about and see is that uh, disabled people and disabled bodies are talked about in a lot of classes um, in ways that are talked about like overcoming adversity. And so rather than like having a space um, in everyday society, they have to be overcoming things. They have to be exceptional. They have to be the best. And uh, that can feel a little bit icky and uncomfortable. Um, we want to make sure that we're trusting and respecting our students when they're advocating for themselves. If they say they need something, they probably need it. And sometimes you can't meet those needs. Um, you know, maybe there's just not enough time in the semester. Um, maybe you have particular needs and that's okay. Just talk to your students about those things. Um, you don't have to meet all of the needs and do all of the things. Um, create environments where everybody can use this accessible material, where they uh, can have access to things, not just people that have legal rights to them. Like I said before, if you wanna create a PDF, but also do a Word document of the same thing and just label them. These are two versions of the same thing. This one's accessible. This one uh, maybe has benefits because of X, Y, Z things. That's great. PDFs are maybe easier for students to look at on their phones. Um, but the Word document is probably more accessible. Just tell your students that that's what you're doing. Um, it doesn't have to be like a, a huge thing. You can still uh, meet the needs of students without uh, spending a lot of time doing uh, doing a bunch of things. Um, thinking about when we're uh, creating policies and when we're grading, thinking about kindness and understanding and creating community um, instead of policing or punishing or uh, asking for compliance. Um, this is huge when we're creating classes and we're trying to connect with our students, but we're also trying to um, get them into our program, get them to be successful, um, make sure that they feel like they have a space here at NIU, but also within your class and the program and um, the major. Um, and I would also sort of like want to close out saying that um, sometimes we talk about the standards that we have in our classes and um, not wanting to water down things, not trying to uh, meet specific needs because it feels like that's not what people should be asking for in college. Um, we're creating a lot of standards and upholding standards that we believe are based off of the real world, quote unquote, um, and what students are gonna be facing in the real world, what they're gonna be facing with their jobs. Um, I would argue that uh, this is a real world. And also we don't know what jobs are gonna look like for people. Work from home is so much more common than it was 10 years ago. We don't know that students aren't gonna be able to uh, move their bodies when they want to eat, you know, what they need to uh, take sick days when they need to. Um, so for us to uphold standards that we think are based off of uh, jobs, um, that they're going to be holding in the future. We just don't know. Um, so think about that too when we're creating standards and we're asking students to meet specific things. Uh, is that based off of what you believe professionals should be doing or is that based off of um, what is going to actually be happening? Okay, we're at time. Thank you all so much for joining me. If you have questions, concerns, anything, feel free to stick in the room for a while. I'll be sending out an email with this recording. And with the resources that I used today, I appreciate you all so much for showing up. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I hope you have 
a wonderful weekend. Bye, everyone.